we had a technical issue with the beginning of the workshop footage. With our apologies, we now join our presenter as she begins to explain joint authorship. If I sit here all alone and I write a screenplay, <laughs> I'm laughing because that's not going to happen. But anyhow, if I write something, I am the sole author. If I do this in conjunction with someone else, we are joint authors. Okay, that seems pretty simple. But who owns the property? Under the US copyright laws, joint authors have an, it's called an undivided 50% interest in that property. And either one of them can go out and exploit that property as long as it doesn't damage the property. So you scratch your head and say, okay, so me and my brother write a screenplay and he can go out and sell it and he doesn't have to tell me? Theoretically, the answer is yes. Realistically, no one's gonna buy it unless it has two signatures. But a better idea would be, first of all, register with the US Copyright Office. You may be saying, I've heard a lot about WGA registrations. I, they provide a very valuable service. It's like a date stamp. So I always tell my, my clients, register your screenplay for copyright protection and or treatment and or pitch materials, whatever it is, and then register with the Writers Guild. Now, I just said whatever it is. And what I'm getting at now is the question of what constitutes copyrightable material. And basically, it's creative expression that is memorialized in a tangible medium of expression. That means written down on a piece of paper, filmed on uh, any media that can be filmed, etc. It has to be in some kind of a permanent medium. So if I'm just talking, are my words protected? No. If it's just an idea, does that constitute copyright? No. Now, having said that, there is a whole law that has developed around idea theft. We don't have to go there. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But the bottom line is I want to impress on everyone tonight that if you create something, it is worth your while for you to register it for copyright protection and register with the Writers Guild before you go out and pitch. And if there's joint authors, if you're writing it with someone else, you're both joint authors and you should have a collaboration agreement. And what does a collaboration agreement do? Well, simply, basically anything the collaborators want. So I'm gonna go back and, and to the elements of copyright ownership. What are the rights? Why am I doing this? You'll see in a minute. To reproduce the copyrighted work, to prepare derivatives works, to distribute copies, to perform the copyrighted work publicly, to display the copyrighted work publicly, and to perform it by means of digital transmissions. If those are the rights under copyright and you've done it, you've done this work with someone else, you've collaborated, you really need to sit down and talk about how are we going to handle these possible exploitations? And that's the purpose of a of a collaboration agreement. So if you're looking at the screen, I also have a sense of humor. So this one is called Dwarfs. And the collaboration agreement is between Grumpy, Wicked Witch, and Snow White. What a collaboration. So they've all come together and they've said, we've contributed time, energy, and resources to develop our project. One's written, one's going to produce, Let's sit down and talk about how we're going to handle this moving forward. So on number one on here is the relationship. So basically it's a statement that we're all going to use our good faith efforts, best efforts in this case, to get this project produced. We intend to create a single purpose legal entity, we'll talk about that later. Most pictures have their own 
legal entity, whether it's an LLC or an Inc. In this case, we're calling it Grimm Productions. And that production company will enter into an agreement with third parties when, when the time is right. Um, the reason that I like to see people make this kind of commitment to each other that they're going to form a legal entity is that in order to produce a show, in order to do all the things that are necessary to move something forward in business, the creators do not want to assume personal liability. A very like big example of this, if you're producing a film and somebody slips down and falls on the set, set, you don't want them suing you personally and taking away your house. Of course, you have insurance in that, but you want them instituting the act against the company that is producing the film, not you personally. That's kind of a simplistic explanation, but that's really why people have one of the advantages of having a separate entity. Okay, enough of that. Number two, services and compensation. This actually is based on a real agreement of three people coming together and they had no idea what the value was of their property. They had no idea what kind of compensation they were gonna get, but they agree to negotiate in good faith. So basically that's enough for the collaboration agreement. Credits, as you will see, Grumpy gets producer, Wicked Witch is a co-producer and a post-supervisor and Snow White's the line producer. I think it always helps when you sit down with someone else and you're moving forward and you kind of don't know who's going to get what. If you stop and think about what's going to be on the screen, what do I want to be on the screen? It will help you define the relationship between all three of you. Costs, same thing. Figure out who's going to pay for what. What do they have to pay for? Well, first of all, a lawyer. Second of all, a pitch deck. And as you know, if you've put together a pitch deck, there's time, energy, and technological savvy that is necessary to put all these things together. And that costs. They also, these people also wanted to make it clear that at the end of the day, they were joining together with an intent to share the profits. So it was important to put that in there. Also, it was important for all of them to understand as they were moving forward. Of course, when they went, to, when they went out pitching to whether it's a company or it's an independent financier, they're going to be negotiating all sorts of terms. They wanted to make it clear that they intended to be equal partners. That's why that was there. Also, too, next, ownership of the property. Back again. They want, wanted the intent to be clear that Grimm Productions was going to own it. The warranties and indemnification is legal language that you'll see in just about any contract that basically will uh, a, a participant will warrant that they have the right to enter into the agreement. And with writers, for instance, that they own it and it's original to them and there are no third party claims. The rest of this is legally legalese and you say well we really haven't decided anything there are no numbers in here we don't know why did you have this agreement because there were three people who all brought something different to a project these three young people knew that there was someone interested it, it's interesting this particular one was had a historical twist to it so they knew that there were some older established people in the, in the industry who would be very interested and they wanted to go pitch it, but they said, let's get together, agree what our roles will be in the production, agree that we're going to form a company and agree that we're going to work together. So that was the purpose of the collaboration agreement. I always think it's a good idea when you're working with someone to have it. Because, again, of the copyright laws on joint authorship, you want to nail down who owns what and who's going to do what. That's the purpose of this agreement. The next concept I'd like to talk about is the difference between authorship and work for hire. I know that there's at least 30 or 40 people here 
who are listening and saying, what is the difference? And I can tell you that you are working. When you go to work for a company and you're putting in a nine to six job or nine to five, whatever it is, that the results and proceeds of your services as an employee with respect to your employer's business is a work for hire. That is the same thing whether it's Paramount Studios or it's an independent producer who is hiring someone to do a specific job. They will be signing a work for hire contract because our copyright law says that independent contractors need to have specific language that the work was intended to be work for hire owned by the employing company or independent contractors unless you're an employee i think i just didn't say this as clear as i should have um but bottom line employees when you're on the job and they're deducting your your uh, social security and all those taxes what you do belongs to your, your boss. An independent contractor, when you're working from job to job to job, that same employer who's not deducting taxes, paying you in gross, and you go and work for him for three days, if he or she wants to own the results and proceeds of your services, there has to be magic contract language that specifies the intent of the parties is for work for hire. And why am I stressing this because under our copyright laws there is no transference of copyright without a written agreement so for instance if i hire an actor or actress to go into a studio and do some voiceover work i'm just using that because it's a simple example even if it's for a commercial if it's for my uh, uh demo reel whatever it is that person who performs the work is considered to be the copyright owner of the creativity that they bring to that product unless you have a work for hire contract so the words that you will see is contractor recognizes that the results and proceeds of his his or her services shall be deemed a work for hire as such is described in the u.s copyright act specially commissioned for use in a motion picture or other audio visual work because there are only certain categories of work where an emp I, I use the word employer I, I, the the person who's paying can buy your creativity and motion pictures is one of the big categories. So bottom line is most people who are going to work on a motion picture are work for hire. When is it not work for hire? I'm going to tell you almost never. In this collaboration agreement, when they start Grim Productions, each one of these individuals, Grumpy, Wicked Witch, and Snow White, will probably have service agreements with Grimm Productions, pursuant to which Grimm Productions owns the results and proceeds of their services. That's just the way it is. Now also I'm gonna alert you to the fact that California has passed a new law, it's called AB5, and there's a lot, of, a lot of controversy about this, that bottom line specifies when people can be independent contractors and when people must be employees. It is having an effect on the business, but the bottom line is, unless you're a licensed professional, like a lawyer, or you have a loan out company entity, which is an LLC or an Inc., and there's some tax issues that you have to deal with, other than that, you will be paid and considered to be an employee. In such situations, when you are an employee, the results and proceeds of your services belong to the employer automatically. Now, there's going to be a lot of different situations and a lot of shades of gray and, and questions on this. But just remember that when you're hiring someone, you want to own the results and proceeds of your services. What am I talking about? I'm talking about writers. 
Now we're going to get into the meat of what intellectual property is all about. Who owns what? So when I was jumping up and down and saying, you've got to file your stuff for copyright protection, it basically is for the writers out there to let you know that you want to make sure that you protect your rights as much as possible. Anything that you create as authorship, you want to have a copyright registration for. Now, when you go to sell your project, however, let's just say that you have written a dynamite screenplay and you want to get it out there and you've got a friend who's a producer and your friend says, let me see what I can do with this property. The question becomes, what kind of an agreement do you have with that person? In our collaboration agreement, there were three who came together and they made up their minds what they were going to do. In this situation, with you as a screenplay writer, you've got something in your hand. You say, hey, am I just going to give somebody the right for nothing to go out and try and sell this? Or do I expect some money from it? And what kind of deals can I make? Well, there basically are two big categories of agreements. I will tell you the latter, which is a shopping agreement, and you will hear about a lot, has only become used widely in the industry, I will say, in the last five years. And I can also tell you that a shopping agreement was used in someone I represented for a pretty big property. Ten years ago, we would not have done it. So what is a shopping agreement? It's between New Pictures and William Shakespeare. <laughs> and, the, and the project is COVID crazy. So what does a shopping ag agreement do? It gives a producer, we'll call it a producer, because if you're going out and shopping properties, you're a producer, the opportunity to tie up a literary property or something else, some other kind of intellectual property for a period of time and basically take it around town. And by the way, around town usually means internationally now, but take it around and see if they can find elements to attach to that property that will bring financing. Sometimes a, an intellectual property is so strong, all you have to do is take it to a bigger fish and the money's on the table and a deal will be struck. Sometimes I find people have to attach a name director, a name star, uh, a name producer before they go to the next step. But basically, if you have written a screenplay or a treatment or a Bible or a pitch and you have given someone a shopping agreement, this is going to be shocking. It's usually a free agreement. Where's the power with the shopping agreement? Now, here's an interesting twist. There's a certain amount of power that lies with the rights holder. Because let's go back to the situation with the shopping agreement. The producer goes out and I'm looking at the agreement. They have an exclusive term. Even if money changes hands, there's an exclusive term here. Usually a right to extend. They have a right to engage in development materials to look at your script and create a pitch deck. And the parties agree that in the event a third party comes along, that's the right page with all the red on it, that a third party comes along and wants to produce this project, then the producer and the creator will sit down, they'll discuss the terms, and they'll come to an agreement that is acceptable for all. And why do I say the power is with the creator? Because if a deal can't be struck, then the producer has wasted his or her time for that amount of time. Or the producer is in a situation where they have to pay more money. So just think about it. If you're a producer and you want to get a hold on, on someone's property, um, 
and you take it to, I keep saying Paramount Studios, just for an example, or Netflix or Amazon or web, wherever you're taking a property, you still have to go back to that writer and negotiate a deal. Where you see all this red, the following points, I have used these kinds of points in order to satisfy the parties that the author is going to get a certain base amount of money to reassure them and that the producer will be entitled to an executive producer credit or whatever the credit may be going forward. The basic things that each party wants. Why? Because if this particular deal is taken to Netflix and that Netflix says, oh, this is a nice project, but producer, we don't want you. We want you to be an associate producer and we're going to hire our own people. That's not going to fly. So basically, it's always good to have these bottom line terms in an agreement. But again, bottom line. If the parties can't come to an agreement about what they're going to do and how they're going to proceed, the producer has wasted his time. On the other hand, and by the way, I, have, I represent producers mostly, although I do have some writers and some reality folks, but mostly producers and, and rights holders. Most producers that I represent will not enter into shopping agreements. They hate them. They don't want them. They want to do traditional option purchase agreements. Why? In an option purchase agreement, the producer will say to the writer, I will give you $10,000 for a term of, and this one is 12 months, extendable by another payment for another 12 months or 24 months. All these terms are movable, by the way. And all the producer has to do is exercise the option and pay the pre-negotiated purchase price and the producer owns the property. So if you think about the difference between this and a shopping agreement, the power is on the side of the producer. There is no question that there's a deal there. There is no question that all they have to do is pay it. This is the traditional way of tying up property as opposed to the shopping agreement. So uh, consider that. But the downside with an option purchase agreement is that generally it requires money. I have almost never had anyone with a finished piece of intellectual property, whether it's a screenplay and certainly not a book, who would enter into an option purchase agreement and give someone a free option. Free option, basically, I see for shopping agreements, but not for option purchases. The issue that the producer gets uh, uh, tied up with, with an option purchase agreement is that, as you can see from this, it's, and this is a simple one, it's a more complicated negotiation. You have to agree on a purchase price. Sometimes there's a floor and a ceiling, but generally you have to agree. And just for those of you who have gone through production, generally what a producer does is thinks in, is in his or her mind that 5% of the production budget goes to rights. Of course, there's always leeway there, but Two and a half percent for the screenplay, two and a half percent for the underlying rights. So you have to know your business and what kind of a movie you intend on making in order to feel comfortable with the purchase price. Next, and, and most producers are thinking, well, if I agree to pay this money on purchase, I better make sure that I am pitching this to a studio, a network, a streamer, that can back me up financially. So I've had situations where people have agreed to pay way too much for a property and then taken it to market and found out there just wasn't the support for it. So that's another thing a producer needs to know the market. 
And then that's purchase price and contingent compensation. And by the way, these terms are all over the map, especially now. I, don't, I imagine most of you have been uh, aware of the fact that the streamers generally do not pay net profits, although there's some negotiations going on, but for the last, last X number of years, as the traditional studios have always paid net profits, no, excuse me, granted net profits, payment is another thing, <laughs> but basically that, that these things are not so unusual. So this has become a hot topic for lawyers who are making rights deals. And basically what happens in the typical option purchase agreement today is that purchasers, that means the people with the money, want to own all audio visual rights. It is pretty much unusual for a book to be sold or for a screenplay to be sold in which the purchaser can't make a sequel or a remake. Of course, there are terms here that have to be met. But in this situation, what was reserved was print, print publications and dramatic stage performances. So not unusual to see that, that the author said, hey, I'm coming to you to make a motion picture. I'm not coming to you to do a stage performance of it, nor to print the screenplay. Again, all over the map, depending upon the power on each side of the table of how many rights get sold and what rights can be reserved, I can tell you that this is a very simplistic option purchase agreement based on a property that was not a high commercial property. I have also done a, recently a book agreement. The option purchase agreement was 35, 40 pages long. And we had to negotiate up front every single right that we could think of and who holds on to it, who gets it. If they don't use it, when does it revert? So these agreements, intellectual property rights agreements, are probably some of the most complicated that you will see. Again, it requires a trained lawyer to do this. Much more difficult than a simple shopping agreement. And then what I'd like to show you at the back end of this agreement, there's an Exhibit A, short form option agreement. And then Exhibit B is short form purchase agreement. So you might say, well, you already have the, the long form. What do you need these things for? A smart producer will always get a short form option and a short form purchase so they can be filed with the U.S. Copyright Office. Why file with the U.S. Copyright Office? It's not a registration. What it does, it puts the world on notice that the producer has rights in this property. And as I said at the beginning, that the world uses the US Copyright Office to put the world on notice for rights, you would want to do this too. Because any time any major player or even a minor player with a lawyer wants to make a movie, the first thing we all do is search the public record to make sure that title is clear. In fact, there are lawyers that specialize in nothing but title checks, copyright reports, etc. Very important thing. And that's what those two exhibits are for. And the other reason that you want the short form option, if you'll take a look at the option and the short form option and purchase, there's no numbers on it. All it does is state the simple fact. This property has been optioned by XYZ. This property has been purchased by XYZ. Doesn't tell you how, how much money. Otherwise, if you were to file the whole, the whole contract with the Copyright Office, you would be putting the deal into the public record. And most people don't want to do that. So these short form documents have been utilized, well, I've been in the business a long time since forever. So that's what a good option purchase agreement is going to look like. So just in quick summary, 
unless you're a work for hire or you're doing work for hire and there is action with your intellectual property, your screenplay, your book, your treatment, whatever the case may be, and a producer comes to you and wants to deal with it, there probably are going to be three options here. One is going to be a traditional option purchase agreement in which there will be money paid for an option and all the terms will be negotiated up front in a fairly long form, form agreement. That's door number one. Door number two is the more fashionable shopping agreement. When a producer will say, look, you give me a certain amount of time and I'll go out there and I'll get us a deal and put this project together and we'll negotiate the terms when the money is coming to be more real or I get it set up at a studio. That's a shopping agreement. And then the third door is really the truly independent situation where people come together and where I've seen it, it's been someone who writes and someone who writes a little and produces and someone else who wants to be the director and they come together and they do a collaboration agreement. Now that collaboration agreement can also be two writers and you set out the terms of who's going to own what more distinctly than just generally as is uh, uh, mandated under the copyright law. But those are the three kind of agreements that you will see and want to do or think about when you create a work of authorship. I'm looking at a list and I want to put some thoughts in your mind. First of all, some of you may already be union members, Writers Guild members. Keep in mind that there are provisions that override certain terms if you are a Writers Guild member. The reason people want to become a, write, a member of the Guild is that they set minimum terms and conditions. So we always have to be mindful of how you're making a deal and what you're promising and what's going to happen if you're a member of the Writers Guild. I'm not saying this negatively. I'm saying that they protect rights and they have certain minimum standards and it's a good thing. Uh, I'm just saying that you need to be mindful of it. Um, I think if you're a writer, you want to, and you're selling something, you're going to say, okay, this big bad studio, streamer, network, whatever it is, wants to buy out my whole property. But I created this intellectual property. Why should they have the benefit of this? You think to yourself, well, how about royalties? If I create the, the series, I want to create it by royalty and I want to create it by credit. How about some kind of residual payments? That's where the Writers Guild would come in and mandate residuals. Or you could ask for something yourself. How about if they want to rewrite this screenplay? Well, maybe you should have the first, the first right or first opportunity to rewrite the screenplay. Or maybe the first opportunity to do sequels, remakes, those kinds of things. And when I just said sequel, remakes, etc., there are standards in the industry for payment to writers who have created material to be, get continuing passive payments for those kinds of exploitations of their intellectual property. There are also sales bonuses, success bonuses. I've done series sales bonuses. And where when the series is sold, the creator will get some kind of monetary compensation. And then the last thing that I briefly touched on is back-end participations. Now, it'll be interesting to see how the industry develops in the next few years with all the success of streamers, but the studios are still in a situation where they are giving back-ends to creators. There are so many different formulas. Uh, it probably is confusing to someone who's coming into the industry. I will tell you that the terms net proceeds and net profits generally mean the same thing. And net is at the very end of the pipeline after everything has been paid. The general rule of thumb is something has to be wildly successful for net profits ever to be declared. Just because there's so many 
people, organizations, and things that have to be done where money is coming out of the pipeline. Gross and adjusted gross participations are also given, but if you look at the definitions, it's not always what you think. It's just better than net profits. And these wild gross participations and bonuses, that's movie star, movie star time. And they have to be really, really, you have to be really, really big to get those huge bonuses and huge amounts of money. Although we do know that it does happen. If you read uh, Deadline Hollywood, Reporter, Variety, et cetera. What I did was kind of outlaw, outline dealing with your intellectual property. I've said it about 10 times, register your work, register your work. Believe me, register your work. As an artist, what is the best way to retain ownership of your work while working for someone else? Well, I'll tell you in shorthand, the sad truth is that there's a golden rule and it's those with the gold rule. It's very difficult for a creator, a writer, to ho hold on to the intellectual property ownership of their property. It is, it's rare. I mean, you have to be extremely powerful uh, to negotiate one picture licenses without any further obligation to the financing party. Because if you think about it, the, the parties that are financing a production, they want to reap the benefits of whatever continuing uh, work is going for, forth. When you say that you want to hold on, you don't want to do work for hire, all work for motion pictures work for hire. I will tell you that if you're making an independent production, you will not be able to distribute it in mainstream or sometimes even not so mainstream distribution channels without providing proof that every individual who provided services on the motion picture were work for hire. There are three things you have to have in the contract, that all money has been received, that it's work for hire and the producer owns the results and proceeds, and that the employee or independent contractor has waived a right to get injunctive relief, which means you can't stop the distribution of the product. So in terms of you saying you don't want to be work for hire, then it becomes work of authorship, which I say is sitting at home alone and writing, uh, writing your script. Then it's a work of authorship, you own it. And then when you go out to try and sell it, it's going to be very, very unusual when someone is going to give you a one picture license. But what you can do is you can monetize all those rights. What you can do, and, and I think what, what is something you ought to think about is the concept of reacquisition and turnaround. Let's just say you've entered into an option purchase agreement and they've purchased your screenplay or they purchased a screenplay and they haven't made it and years have gone by. Well, what can be put into those kinds of agreements is that if the picture is not produced, then the owner has the right to reacquire the screenplay that was paid for and lots of different terms, like usually when it's set up and there might be an interest payment, thank goodness interest payments are so low right now, but I'm just saying those things do exist. And if somebody does buy your screenplay and they insist on buying all rights whatsoever, there should be monetary streams that attach to all the exploitation. What is not considered to be copyrightable? The issue is sufficient creativity. If I, if I do some artwork that doesn't, that's just like, I'm just thinking of a piece of paper with a couple of black lines, X on it. I can't claim copyright in that. So I can see where an examiner would look at the piece of visual art and say it does not contain sufficient creativity and it's not individual enough for me to award a copyright certificate to it. But I have to tell you, in the literary world, I've never had that happen. I've never confronted that issue. And certainly not with film. You know, an interesting issue came across my desk recently in which there was a recorded conversation with a, an expert in a certain area of art and technology. That conversation was turned into a transcript. That transcript was put into a book. 
That book was subject to copyright. And the question is, is that particular picture of the transcript subject to copyright? And my knee-jerk reaction is no, because basically all they're doing is copying what was said. Not only that, I'm not sure there was anything creatively in that trans, I mean, it's a transcript, it's somebody else's copyright, unless the original author copyrighted that work, which I doubt it wouldn't have been copyrightable. And it's like common words are not copyrightable, ideas are not copyrightable. I'd have to look at this, uh, you know, typical lawyer's question and, and answer. I'd have to look at the individual product to try and figure out why they denied copyright. Can you register your works with the Writers Guild, even if you aren't a member of the Guild? Yes, it costs 25 big ones. And it's <laughs> worth it very much. And I have clients from around the world, the first thing they do is register with the Writers Guild. And one of the reasons that they do it, you know, there used to be something called poor man's copyright when people would send themselves the same document. Basically what it is, is a date stamp and it establishes when someone wrote it. And it's a wonderful service that the, that the Writers Guild provides. And all you do is go to wga.org and put in the search engine registration and all the information will come up. And then when you send out your property, you put it at the bottom, register, they give you a registration number and you put it under that. So basically it's like saying to someone, don't mess with me. Do I need to keep re-registering my works as they develop? Theoretically, the answer is yes. Usually, but if it's a if it's a screenplay, I, I wouldn't register it until you felt comfortable that it was a pretty final copy, just for the financial reasons, etc. Usually what happens is that people write screenplays and we register it for copyright and then the movie gets made three years later and, and they say, well, what about the new stuff that's in the movie? I've changed the screenplay. Anything that's not cop uh, captured in that original copyright will be captured by the movie copyright. So that's one example. In terms of writing and rewriting a screenplay, you know, it still costs money to file for copyright and it's a time consuming project. I'm, if no one's seeing it and you're not worried about it, I'm not sure I would keep registering it until you're going out there with it. And keep in mind that the original work would always still be subject to copyright protection. So that's covered. And also remember that, that just because you haven't registered for copyright doesn't mean you still can't claim copyright in your original creation and it lasts uh, for 70 years after your death. Should an author form an LLC before they approach a publisher? Not necessarily. Uh, the, the issue with LLCs, particularly in California, is that it costs money to set it up. And uh, I'll just go quickly. You have to set up the LLC. You have to file a statement of information, which tells the world uh, uh, what you're doing. You have to agent for service of process. Uh, once you give them an address, your LLC is like a human being. It has to register to do business in its local jurisdiction and get a local business license. And then you have to file every year and it costs $800 minimum tax. So if you're a struggling write, uh, writer and you've just done one thing, to have an LLC that is continuing with $800 a year in, and file a tax return, uh, both with the state and federal government, it, it can be burdensome. I would say that when you get the deal in hand, you can do this very quickly, <laughs> okay? It's a paper transaction. It's, it's a little bit arcane, but it can be done quickly. Can improv be copyrighted? I would, boy, that's an interesting question. Wow. When you're saying improv, um, I'm just thinking what it is, is comedy and an act. Uh, it would have to be recorded in a tangible medium of expression. That means written down or filmed. And then the other issue is how much of it is protectable as unique copyrighted work that you could stop somebody else from using. That's always a creative issue that would have to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. But yeah, if you're going to stand up at the comedy club and tell jokes, you might, you might want to record it, file it for copyright, but I would, I would put it on a piece of paper. Can I use the CNA circle on works that I haven't registered with the Copyright Office? Is it important to register my works? 
Uh, let me tell you an interesting point. First of all, you're not supposed to use the C in a circle unless you have obtained a U.S. copyright registration. You're supposed to spell out the word copyright. Now, I can tell you that that is violated on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. <laughs> I've seen it myself. So I want to answer that question precisely. Claiming your copyright is not a bad idea. It's always a good idea. Do you have to register it? The answer is no. Prior to 1978, the answer was yes. But after 1978, we joined the Berne Convention in which we take the position that copyright exists, or the word is subsists. It exists for life of the author plus 70 years. And there's different rules here, whether it's published or not published. But to give you a simple answer to your question, I think you should claim copyright on your work. I'm concerned that if I try to register my works myself, I might mess up. If I mess up, is it permanent? You know, I have to tell you, I feel for you. <laughs> because I have sat and looked at those copyright forms and said, am I doing this right? Am I doing this wrong? Does it exactly fit here? The good thing about the copyright office is that if you wait online, in line long enough on the phone, Somebody will answer your question. That's number one. And if you make a mistake, they will correct the rec registration. So I would say, don't worry about it. Try to ask the right questions and do it. As a music composer, what action should I take prior to negotiating with film and TV folks to ensure best outcomes? And what sort of terms should I look for in agreements? I don't do music work except with respect to motion pictures. And I can tell you that uh, the, it's kind of all over the map in terms of the clout of the composer, um, how badly the producers want the music, and also the size of the film and the producer itself. Uh, recently did a film where all the music was licensed in. Also, this composer, there wasn't a lot of money, so the composer gave the, the producer a non-exclusive perpetual license subject to like a five-year holdback of rights. And then after that time, he had the right to use the score somewhere else. That's an unusual situation, but, you know, it did happen. It depends. I know that sounds silly, but it just depends on all those different factors. I've also done work uh, for a client that all the composers were work for hire. But in that deal for work for hire, the writer composer of the song did not give up and cannot give up their, their right to public performance royalties that are co collected in connection with the movie. Those are collected by ASCAP, BMI, etc., and go right to the writer. So my first knee-jerk reaction is, do you belong to public performance society? And number two is your music. Do you have a publisher? Or I would assume that you're self-published. You have to think about that. And number three, you want to try and avoid work for hire for motion pictures as much as possible so that you own your work and can reuse it. But again, a difficult situation. A lot of the work is work for hire. I want to thank you all. I appreciate the fact that you are interested in protecting your rights. I want to encourage you all to keep doing what you're doing and take advantage of what's available to you. Mm -hmm.